Shana Tova. My mom asked me about God this year. She had a roommate in the hospital in April. She's doing fine. She had a procedure. But her roommate in the hospital prayed to Jesus and got a raise from $8 to $10 an hour. And my mom did not say anything at the time. But she was a little bothered. She was bothered by the notion of God so intimately involved with each human life while so many good people suffer. And so, sometime this summer, she asked me. And I was humbled by her question. It felt strange, like a changing of places for my mom who taught me so much to ask me something about something like that. But she asked, and so I shared with her some of where my own faith comes from, and I want to share some of that with you, this Rosh Hashanah. When people ask me how I decided to become a rabbi, I sometimes joke with them that there was a bright white light <laughs> And a deep voice that said, become a rabbi. <laughs> but the truth is, is that there have been moments when I've felt God's presence. The summer of 1994, many people could have looked at my life and said it looked per perfect from the outside. I had graduated with a bachelor's and master's from Northwestern University. I had finished up a swimming career. I was spending the summer coaching and managing the pool where I grew up, making money so I could go to Israel that fall. And I was getting to head off on a big adventure. And from the outside, I'm sure my life looked like some kind of perfect, but it wasn't that way. While I enjoyed that summer, I had a friend named Jay, who was a friend in high school, a roommate of mine in college, had been diagnosed with leukemia, got a bone marrow transplant, seemed to be getting better, and that January had gone to live in London to start his life anew and finally get that chance at a regular life that he had never had. But after years and years of treatments, for whatever reason, his muscles stopped being able to rebuild themselves, and he was getting weaker, and he returned home from London at the beginning of the summer, and I watched him that summer go from walking with a cane to walking with a walker to being in a wheelchair to being bedbound. I had another very close friend from high school we had room together. He called me in the middle of the summer while I was at the pool. It was a wonderful phone call. He just said, I want to tell you how much I love you. I didn't know that he was in the middle of a plan. He was calling to say goodbye. He's okay. But he had bought a gun. And if you ever want to know why waiting periods are important, it saved his life because during those 72 hours, he told his parents and he was able to go and get help. But he was at that moment at the end of the summer in a mental hospital. And I didn't know if he was going to make it. I visited with him just a few weeks ago. So as I got on the plane, 
I was feeling conflicted. I was excited for the year, but I also felt that I was abandoning my friends. I went to study at a place called Wujis World Union for Jewish Students, the Wujis Institute in Arad. It's where Jennifer and I met. She started in January, I started in the fall, and as part of the first few months of the program, we went on a tiyul, we went on a trip to the Negev, and we spent days and days hiking, and at the end of the last day of hiking, before we were heading back, we were gathered around a campfire, and dinner was being passed around, and people were singing songs with a guitar and passing around bottles of wine. And I went and took my seat and had some dinner and took some wine and started to listen to the songs. And as I listened more and more to the songs, they reminded me of childhood, and they took me back to the troubles that I had left behind at home. And I decided when the next bottle of wine came around that I would take it with me. And I got up and walked away from the campfire. Walked away from the campfire into the desert and climbed one of the small craggy hills. Climbed down. The sounds of the campfire faded, the light of the fire faded. I climbed back up and then down into another canyon. And by the time that I got down into that second canyon, I was alone. There was no music, there was no light, there was only darkness. And I took a drink of that wine, and I took another, and it wasn't healthy. And I sat, and I started to cry, and I started to breathe, and I called out, why? Why? No. And I took the bottle, and I stood up, and I hurled it across the canyon. And I lay down, and I cried, and I cried. But I didn't feel alone. Beneath a blanket of stars, with my sadness, it's the first time that I can say that I sensed God's presence there with me. It was a powerful moment. I returned to Wujis. I studied. I was there to learn about Judaism. Moments are important, but ultimately they are not sustaining. And I came to believe more and more in God. But that ongoing faith came not from a moment, but from something within me. It was an aching, yearning constant feeling that when I look around at the world, this matters. And I want you to know that from the perspective of the universe, if a chair gets broken or a human being gets broken, it makes no difference in the realm of the universe in eternity. Both are made up of different combinations of elements that were there when the universe was born. Every morning in the Jewish liturgy, we wake up and we say, what are we, what is our life, our kindness, our righteousness, our salvation, our strength? Heroes are like nothing. The famous are as if they never were. The preeminence of man over a beast does not exist when all is vanity. But I don't believe that. I think that there is a difference if a person dies or if an ant dies. But from the perspective of gravity and the laws of the universe, it makes no difference whatsoever. Rabbi Mark Gelman 
studied with an existentialist rabbi and professor Richard Rubinstein who did believe something like that. He wrote as follows, we have nothing to hope for beyond what we are capable of creating in the time allotted to us. In the final analysis, all things crumble away into the nothingness which is at the beginning and which is, end, and which is at the end of creation. Shana Tova. Gelman tells the story that on the first day when he started work at Northwestern University, there was a young man in his office waiting to talk to him. He looked distressed. He sat down. The young man said to him, I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you about what happens after we die. And Gelman looked across at him and said, after you die, I believe that worms eat you. <laughs> the man left sobbing. <laughs> And Gelman later wrote, many rabbis now call me for advice and I tell them all, answer only trivial questions for the first 10 years of your rabbinate. <laughs> it may be ironic to quote Nietzsche in a sermon that is about faith in God, but Nietzsche understood, I think, more than his critics and more than those who read them. The one who gave us the phrase, God is dead and we have killed him, understood the consequences of that thought. He wrote, if one removes the belief in God, one thereby breaks the whole thing to pieces. One has nothing of consequence left in one's hands. No foundation for ethics, no holiness, no morals, might makes right is what we're left with. But I don't believe that. I believe that life has consequence. My leap of faith is not in God, but actually in the meaningfulness of my experience in the world. And that is where my belief in God came from. And I told my mom, I said to her, it's ironic that you ask me about this. Because the truth is that you, in the way that you raised me, in the childhood that I was blessed to have, gave me a sense that my life is meaningful, that life is meaningful, that the world matters, that how we treat people matters. And that, for me, is where my faith comes from. Why do I tell you this today? It's certainly not to tell you what to believe or that you have to believe what I believe in order to be a good person or a good Jew. God forbid. It's not what I'm saying. I share it in part because I feel lucky to be the rabbi of this wonderful community. And I want us to share more and more and get to know each other better and better as the years go on. And I also share it because when I got back from my sabbatical and got settled in over the summer and looked towards the high holidays, I sent out a survey and I asked the question, what are you thinking about this year? What are you worried about? What's, what, do you what do you have in your heart? And as you can imagine, in a beautiful and varied community, there were many, many answers. But there was one theme that seemed to bubble forth. And it was, what do we do if when we look at the long arc of, moral, of the moral universe and it actually doesn't seem to be bending towards justice? How do we live in a broken world? If faith comes from looking at the world, when the world looks broken, where does our faith come from then? There is a story that is told about a Jewish woman in the 1930s who goes to a travel agency in Germany and she says, I've decided to move. And the travel agent, and she says, I want you to help me pick a place. And the travel agent pushes a globe across the counter and says, where in the world would you like to go? And she turns the globe, <laughs> turns it again, studies it for a minute, 
pushes it back across the counter and says, do you have another world? <laughs> many, many people are feeling that way this year. But the answer, of course, is that we don't have another world. And in such a world, where does our faith in God come from? An answer that I want to share with you to that question is an insight from a book called The Great Partnership, Science, Religion, and the Search for Meaning written by Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, someone who visited our community just a couple of years ago. And in that book, he writes about how the Greeks framed the existence of suffering and God as some sort of logical riddle. You have heard me talk about this before, that within Greek logic, God is all-powerful and God is all-knowing and God is, is all-good. And therefore, if evil is real, how can evil exist? And Sachs writes that that Greek formulation of the question, while interesting, doesn't map on to the Jewish way of thinking about these questions. He says that in the Hebrew Bible, God is not the solution to a contradiction, but is a call to become partners in the work of redemption. God is not an answer. God is a call to partnership and responsibility. When the Bible wants to write about suffering and theology and theodicy, it brings us the book of Job. It tells us a story, not a philosophical paper. And that book is the most in-depth inquiry into the purpose of evil that we have. And in the story, we know that Job is innocent. We know that Job suffers And his friends come to him over and over and over again and say, it must be something that you did. We love you, we care for you, but what God gives you is good for you. It must be something that you did because God must be just and therefore there must be some sort of thing to this. And Job insists and he says, no. I refuse to believe that. I'm not a perfect person, but I do not deserve that which is happening to me. And we know that he is right. And at the end of the book, at the end of the book, we are told that God comes and says to Eliphaz, the Yemenite who was one of his friends, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken the truth about me as my servant Job has. Job is right to call out. He's right to question. He's right to say, why is this happening to me? In the book of Genesis, we'll read a very different story about Abraham tomorrow, but in another story, God says, shall I withhold from my servant Abraham that which I am going to do? And it is an invitation. And Abraham says, will the judge of all the earth not do justice? Will God sweep away the innocent with the wicked? And God is pleased with his call, pleased with his question. Sachs writes that the cries of Job and Abraham and Jeremiah and Habakkuk were cries born in the cognitive dissonance between the world that is and the world that ought to be. And the only way of resolving this dissonance is deed. That is the difference between faith as acceptance and faith as protest. The only way to deal with, sla with slavery, writes Sachs, is to lead the people to freedom. The only way to confront the evils of the polis is to build a more just social order with special emphasis on loving the stranger. God, he writes in Abraham's faith is not the solution to a contradiction, but the call to a journey that will eventually change the world by showing there is another way to live, an alternative to the will to power. My teacher, Rabbi Eliezer Diamond, writes about the metaphors of Rosh Hashanah 
and they are they can be good and they can be productive but they can also be very unproductive we will sing later again avinu malkenu our father our king and of course we can relate to god as a parent and as someone bigger than ourselves but the problem with those metaphors is that they risk making us passive they risk making us think that there is nothing for us to do except to accept what happens, but that is not the purpose of the shofar. The shofar calls us to action. It calls us to responsibility. It calls us to take part in the world and not just to let it unfold as it is. Not to accept the world and God as it is, to, but to be God's partner in building something better. My mom used to tell me that Judaism is not a religion that lets you check your, check your brain at the door. It was her way of telling me that we are a tradition, of course, that values Talmud Torah study, not only in the Jewish tradition, but also, as we have seen, when the walls of the ghetto came crumbling down, how Jews have won Nobel Prizes in disproportion to our numbers. We've helped advance human knowledge. But I think that she also meant something else, not just that we should use our minds, but that in the Jewish tradition, we are God, a belief in God, does not give us permission to look away, to withdraw from a broken world, to plug our ears to the cries of the widow, the orphan, and the stranger. We are called. We are called to fix a world. And God needs our partnership. Perhaps more than ever, we are called to the work of redemption. Shana Tovah.